Hey guys, welcome to Adrian's Digital Basement. Today we're going to talk about the computer you see right here on my left. An IBM PC 5150. I won't talk too much about the significance of the IBM PC 5150 because there are lots of other YouTube videos that go over this in great detail and are worth watching. But I own this particular computer and the matching monochrome 5151 monitor and there's a problem with this computer. Two days ago, my friend Dave Just Dave was here and I was showing him the computer and I turned it on and it literally turned on and ran for about three seconds and then just shut off. Let me show you what's going on exactly. If I hit the power switch, look what happens. So you hear the fan running. I don't know if you can hear it on the video, but the fan is working, but the computer's not turning on. Now this is a Rev A or Rev 1 machine, the very earliest models that only have 64K on the motherboard, a maximum of 64K I might add. And the power supply, and this is the original black power supply, has a fan that's actually a 120 volt fan. So while we're hearing the fan, the rest of the power supply is actually shut down. We can see a little bit of something going on if we look at the hard drive LED here as I turn the power on. Watch. Do you see it blinks for just a split second? It's, it might be even too hard to see on the camera, but yes, this light does come on for a second and then shuts off. Let's pop the lid and take a closer look. So inside the computer, nothing is too out of the ordinary. Now, if you know your IBM 5150 history, they originally came with one or two floppy drives. They were single-sided 180K think drives and that was because those were on the very early machines. Now this machine has been upgraded. It has a 360k double-sided floppy drive so this is not the original IBM one anymore and it actually has a hard drive. It's got a three and a half inch tandem hard drive. I can't remember the model number but it's a half high drive and I also have a GoTech in here. It's actually not connected at the moment but the GoTech allowed me to transfer files on and off the machine. Now this power supply is from 1981. It is the original one that came with this computer. And people might just say right off the bat that this is probably dead, but I actually don't think so. I found this supply to be pretty robust and really well made. So from a troubleshooting standpoint, I think the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the power cables off the motherboard. That's gonna separate the cards and the motherboard from these drives. And if the drives and the hard drive spin up, then that probably tells me that the power supply is fine because these need five and 12 volts to run. And maybe the problem lies with one of these peripheral cards or the motherboard. So if we pull the power cables off, these just come straight off the motherboard really easily. They've probably been removed a million times. So there are the two cables. Let's power this on. There we go. So this actually works. So that right away tells me the power supply is probably working fine. Just to double check things, I'm going to use my multimeter to measure the voltages on the power supply. To help me measure, I'm going to just use some clip leads on my multimeter probes and attach these uh, metal screwdriver pick things or whatever so I can just poke into the connector a little more easily. Okay, so on the volt setting, let's poke this into the 5 volts, 5.1. That's okay. Now the regulation might be a little bit off only because we aren't really loading the power supply properly and this is a very old switching power supply. Negative five volts, that looks good. This is the white wire on that connector. Let's take a look at this other connector here. So we have the black wires which are ground and then we have two sort of well, be yellowish and a pinkish wire and I think the yellow should be 12 volts. 12.2, that's good enough. And it should be negative 12 on this one, negative 11.1. Again, ignore that weird voltage fluctuation just because of the uh, strange uh, load we have on the power supply. And the final pink wire here, or orange, or whatever color that is, is probably power good. I don't think it will measure as anything. Okay, it measures as five. Everything looks good on the power supply right now. So that means the problem is lying with the motherboard or the peripheral cards. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull the peripheral cards out. That's the easiest thing to do to kind of rule out issues. So here we have a better look at the original motherboard. 
and you see this is fully populated with the 64K of RAM. This motherboard supports 16 to 64K. It's actually kind of funny to think that the first IBM PC, which is fully compatible up to, say, DOS 6.2 here, you could run all the DOS programs on this, only came with 64K of memory, which is like what a Commodore 64 has on it. And that's it. Of course, it can be expanded through these expansion slots. I uh, go up to 564 or 574 or whatever the, the memory is maxed out. But it's just pretty hilarious. So on, you know, first appearance, everything looks fine on this board. I think I'm just going to connect the power cables back to the board and we're going to see if the computer turns on. If there's still a fault, then I know it exists within the motherboard itself and it has nothing to do with those cards I just took out. So I'm connecting these types of connectors together, commonly referred to as AT, but clearly this is an, not an AT. And it was used though th all the way through the AT before ATX came out. The black wires always go in the middle. And I think the saying was, if you have red, you're dead. And maybe there was some other part of it, but the black wires are always in the center because you can switch the two connectors around and that will damage things. So, okay, back connected. Let's turn the power back on. Yep, same problem. It just immediately shuts off. So there's still a fault. So for troubleshooting, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull one of these off. So I pull this connector off here, which has the negative 12 and the positive 12, and I'll just leave the five volts, negative five volts, and ground connected to the motherboard. Now, this computer, I think most PC motherboards don't use 12 volts on the board at all, but this particular one has four 116 RAM chips, which are old. Eight chips makes a mere 16K, and those need plus five, minus five, and plus 12 to even work. So the RAM chips for sure are using the 12 volts. So the computer will not work, absolutely not work for sure, with the 12 volts expected, because clearly we have no RAM. I'm not sure what other chips on here use it. I haven't looked at the schematics, but let's see if this turns on with the 12 volt disconnected. And there we go. Computer boots up fine with the 12 volt connected. Well, boots up, it's powered up at least. So since I know that the five volt rails are working, that's this connector that's closer to me, it's gotta be a problem on the plus 12 or the negative 12. It's probably shorting out the power supply and these, these aren't that powerful. I think this is maybe a 60 or 70 watt supply. So it just protects itself by turning off to prevent damage to the motherboard. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the multimeter and we're gonna set it to ohms and we're gonna check the pins on the power connector here and look for a short. Anytime you see something around zero ohms, then we know that's a short. I could demonstrate that by taking the two test leads here and touching them together. When I do that, we get 0 0.05 ohms, which is basically a short. When you disconnect this, you get OL, which means it's overload, which is just open. It's, it's infinite, it's infinite resistance right now. And that's why OL is displayed. Okay, so I tried to prop this up in a way that you guys could see the results. What we're going to do is we're going to connect the multimeter probes to the ground, which is one of these black wires, and then one of these two wires here, the kind of orangey or the yellowy one or the pinky one. I mean, it's, I don't know, these colors are weird. They're sort of non-standard. Okay, so I'm going to be touching the third wire over, which I think is negative 12 volts. It's the pink wire. And it's touched, it's being touched right now. Oh, you can't see the multimeter. It's showing OL, and that just means that there's actually nothing. There's no continuity whatsoever. But that makes sense to me because negative 12 volts, I don't think is used at all. And all it does is perhaps is routed to the ISA bus. Well, and I have all the cards unplugged, so nothing is possibly even using that. But if I move over to the next pin, that would be plus 12, not negative, plus 12. And yeah, can you see the multimeter there? It's reading 0.24 ohms. That would be a short circuit. So something on this motherboard has shorted the 12 volts to ground, which of course, as soon as the power supply detects that, it just shuts off to protect itself. So the next step is gonna be taking the board out of this case and trying to figure out what's going on. Let's take this motherboard out. So I printed out the schematics for the 5150 and when you do this, you just have to be careful that there are two versions of the motherboard. There's the 64 to 256 version and then there's the one that I have, 
which is the 16 to 64. So this is the earlier one, and then the later one uses uh, DRAM that is higher density, that allows up to 256K on the main motherboard. There are differences specifically around the 12 volts because I had mentioned earlier, the RAM uses 12 volts on this one. It doesn't on the newer one. So I printed out the schematics specifically because I wanted to review quickly to make sure that 12 volts wasn't used anywhere else on the motherboard. And a quick scan through the entire schematics reveals that indeed the 12 volts only seems to be used on the RAM and on the ISA bus. And if I skim through these, don't worry, I've already taken a very close look at these. I only found the 12 volts on those two locations and I did highlight them on the schematic. So when they pop up, we will see them. So here we go. This is the DRAM part of the board. And what it's saying here is there are bypass caps on the 12 volt line. So here's the 12 volts along with the plus five and the minus five. And there are associated bypass caps. Unfortunately, this there is no overall PCB layout to show me where stuff is with these schematics. This is printed from, I think, the technical manual that IBM published. But this is uh, the RAM, and then this is the other banks, because there's actually four banks of RAM, so it's just saying the same thing. And these are hand-drawn and are very hard to read, even printed on this big paper. It's just not a very good scan. And that's it. This is the cassette interface which does use plus five and minus five, but it doesn't use 12 volts. There was the relay. I thought maybe that was using 12 volts, I think for the motor or something like that. But no, this appears to just be a five volt system. And there is the system board keyboard sense control lines. This is all five volts here. And then this is the ISA bus. These are the ISA sockets. And it is saying here that there is a plus, a plus 12, and this is the actual power socket here. And it shows it directly connected. And it shows here the uh, decoupling caps. And that's it. This is all of the schematics for the entire board. And that is where the 12 volts is. So that gives us an idea of where to start looking to troubleshoot this. Because there's only 12 volts used in a few places, there aren't even that many tantalums. And I think a tantalum has probably gone bad and shorted to ground, and that's what's causing the motherboard to work. So to not work. Let's investigate. So what I'm gonna to need to do here is figure out what on this board is actually connected to the 12 volt rail. So what I have is my multimeter connected with this clip onto the 12 volt line on the power connector, and then I have it see on the negative lead. And on the multimeter, I have the continuity beeper activated, so listen. See, so it's beeping. So that means that if I go around the board and I look at every tantalum, and luckily IBM has been very nice and marks pluses on most of the capacitors, so I can see if it's on the 12 volt rail. So this one here, the plus is beeping. And of course, the negative side will beep too because it's shorted right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this Sharpie and I'm just gonna put a blue dot on everything that is actually on the 12 volt rail. And that'll help me measure these more carefully to try to figure out which one of these actually has the short. That's what my hunch is. And when I find it, I'm gonna cut it out and we're gonna see what happens. Okay, so everything is marked. Now what I found coincides with the schematics is that every capacitor that's labeled C6, like that one, that one, that one, that one, are on the 12 volt rail. That's, a, what's, that's what the schematics say. And also every capacitor that's labeled C3, you find one that's easy to see. So that says C3 right there. That is on the 12 volt rail. And there, those are sp splattered around the RAM here, and those are all on the 12 volt rail as well. So there's essentially these large ones, and these are the small ones here, all the ones labeled C3. And then there are a couple other C6s around. Let's see here, those are C7s, C7s. Down here, there's a couple C6s, there's two right there. These are not on 12 volts, that's a C7. So that's it, those are all the tantalums on the 12 volt rail. Now, how do we go about figuring out which ones are, oh, turn the multimeter off. How do we go about figuring out which ones are the short? But what I'm gonna try to do is measure the resistance in ohms with my multimeter on every one of the 12 volt capacitors. And my theory is that any, the one that's causing the short potentially will have a lower resistance. 
So if I short my leads together, we're getting 0.05 and I'll hit relative, so we're down to zero. And I feel like when I measure the one that's shorted, I should have a lower resistance visible on here than all the other ones. Because if one is shorted here, like that's they say this one is a shorted one. Well, the path of resistance that this has to go through is so small, but if I do one of these other ones, it has to actually go through some traces, or say the one over here is short and I, and I measure over here. Well, besides going through the multimeter leads, which I now zeroed out, the, the electrical current has to go through all the other parts of the board too to get to it. So I'm hoping there's enough resolution on this uh, Unity multimeter to allow me to see which one is actually the shorted one. So let's give this a try together and see what happens. Okay, so you can see the multimeter. It's not, it's just in the ohms mode right now. I turned the beeper off because there's no point every single one of these is gonna show is shorted. Let's try with one of these big ones over here. And I will push down on the lead so it gets a good contact. Okay, so we're getting 0 0.06. Let's try the next one over. Point oh seven, so it's a little higher. That might be just normal variance. Let's keep going. Point oh eight, interesting. So it seems to be going up. Point oh nine. Okay, so the one that was point oh six is the one over on the far left here. Let's try it one more time on bank three. So it's 0 0.07, so it's a little higher than it was the first time, and the one next to it also reads 0 0.07, if I recall. Hmm, 0.08. Let me go back there. So that really leads me to believe that whatever the short is, is over in this area. So just for comparison, let's try one of the ones over here, which is really far away from the, the short area, potentially. Yeah, and look, 0.23. So I'm pretty confident the short doesn't exist over on this. There's only two capacitors here, but it wouldn't be one of these two because they're right next to each other. I think it's over here in this area. Now, remember what I said before is it could be the RAM too, and I could just take all the RAM chips out. And that would be one way also to, to kind of eliminate that possibility. But um, I'm still going on the fact that I think it's one of the capacitors. So let's turn this so I can get to it a little easier. So one more time. This one here, 0 0.07, okay, we're getting that low number. Okay, so this here is one of the bad boys. Okay, that's higher number. Higher number again, just slightly higher, but Point oh eight. Point oh nine. We are kind of getting further away and the numbers are going up. Let me try this C3 over here. This is very close by. Point oh eight. Let me go back to the one I that I think it is down here. 0.07 again. So once again, it's really low. So as I go away from that one, the numbers seem to go up. Well, that's a lot higher over there. Let's try this one. 0.10, yep, see, again, we're all higher. Point oh eight's pretty darn close. I wish I had an extra digit of resolution. Point oh nine. But again, if I go back on here. Point 
0.07.06 CS low. Okay, well there's something else I wanna try. So this is a RAM chip right here next to it. Let's just pull that chip off the board. This, it could, you know, what if this chip is the short and it's since it's sitting right there, could well be the problem. So pull that RAM chip off. Now let's check for a short. Same, no change. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna cut the lead off that. I'm gonna cut it in a way that if I had to blob it together again, I could. Okay, so I just snipped one side. Let's check for the short. There we go. Nothing. No more short. So if I measure this with the leg up in the air, not connected to the board, there it is. It's hard to get a good contact. 0.05. Take a look. Look. Let me show you close up how this is. So what I did is I just snipped the leg and see how it's uh, lifted there. Okay, so. The RAM, uh, the power connector, one pin on ground, and it was this one, and we're good. That was it, no more short. It was that tantalum. So that's it. That's the tantalum. Does it look bad? Not to me. Don't see any kind of weird telltale marks on it. But because the power supply on this IBM is not that powerful, this tantalum just was enough to shut the system down as opposed to burning it. A lot of times if you just hook a better power supply up. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to connect. Let's hook the bench power supply to this and let's just see how much current it takes to actually blow it out. Okay, so the bench power supply is hooked up and I'm going to let the magic smoke out of this. Now, I was thinking about just doing this to the board anyways, to like basically hooking the bench power supply up to the 12 volt power connector and just feeding current through it, raising the current, just turning the wick up until whatever was causing the short blew out. But that's pretty rude. If this, say, took a lot of current, it could have burned a trace or maybe, you know, something bad would happen. And I don't want to damage this board. This is really old piece of technology. So now that I found it, Let's see what it takes to burn this out. Okay, so I'm using my cell phone for the second camera. I have it set for 10 milliamps right now. Let's turn the output on. Oops, that's the wrong button. Okay, so we're dead short. Of course, so we're dropped down to zero. And let's turn the wick up. Five hundred milliamps. Still nothing. An amp. That thing is taking an amp of current right now. And it hasn't blown yet. One point one. Wow, this is a little tough mother. 1.5 amps and it still hasn't blown. Come on. Two amps? Let me just double check that. Yeah, it's not like the leads are shorted. I'm sure that's really getting hot. Two and a half amps through that thing. I think this thing only goes up to three. Oh no, it goes up to five. Let's turn this off for a second. So one of the things is I thought the other thing I could do is put power through it, you know, and not necessarily blow it out, but perhaps I would just it's not even warm. So I, th I was going to use the thermal camera to try to figure out if it would, uh, if I could see it with the thermal camera, perhaps what was heating up, and that would obviously lead us right to the bad component. But this thing takes 3.7 amps. 
Let's just crank the wick. Five amps? You little bastard. I can't believe it. Oh, there it goes. Magic smoke. <laughs> oh boy. Whoa, yeah. This might set up the smoke detector in my lab. Look at the smoke in here. <laughs> Not a good idea. What was I doing? <laughs> well, ah, there we go. Okay, the coughing is not related to the smoke, but it stinks in here. Yeah, that 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 let out, that let out a good amount of smoke. And uh, I'm glad I had a little post-it pad on here. It left a little burn mark. But anyhow, so. <laughs> There we go. What was I up to? Five amps there? That's what it took to blow that out. So that's why I didn't try to blow it out with a power supply because it probably would have damaged the motherboard at five amps. I don't know. Maybe not. Either way, I found the cap. Ultimately, since we know one failed, it's a matter of time before more fail. So I'm probably going to have to one day just recap all the tantalums. I mean, luckily there aren't that many. I mean, if we look at these big ones here, you know, there's maybe 10 or 12 on the entire board. But maybe it's time for me just to order these and I will just uh, replace them all. But anyhow, let's uh, let's fix this. I'm gonna put a cap in place there. I don't know if I have the right tantalum, but I'll just stick something in temporarily and um, then I'll order the right part and I just wanna get this computer working again. Well, here's my real craptastic fix, but I just had a 10 microfarad sitting around, so I just soldered that on. And that'll work. It's an electrolytic. It'll work for now until I, I get some new tantalums. I need to order a bunch of tantalums anyway. So I'm going to order a whole set for this board. And I'll eventually recap the whole thing. All right, let's do a smoke test. Board's back in. It's so easy to work on these old computers. It really is. I have my postcard in. Let's take a look at that. And I'm going to hit the power switch. And we'll see together if this thing boots up with all the power rails. Okay. Power's connected to the power supply. Here we go. Looking good, we got all the rails and FF is normal. This BIOS doesn't support postcodes, but the fact that it says FF means that the CPU is working and the RAM is running and everything. So the question is, is my are my RAM chips damaged? I don't know, I'll figure that out once I put all the cards back in. But there we go, we're back in business. Okay, so that was one successful fix. IBM 5150 is now running in tip top shape. The computer's back in operation. It was that one bad tantalum. So I guess I need to recap this thing. Maybe that'll be for a future video. And I do need to restore this back to its original configuration. Get rid of this silly GoTech. I don't really need that anymore. But I will be doing that soon. I have some parts I can put in here that are much more period correct for it, including an IBM branded disk drive. But anyhow, there we go. So uh, I hope you found this interesting. Maybe you uh, can fix some of your own stuff if you have bad tantalums figure out which one's gone bad and uh there we go thanks for watching uh put your comments and questions in the comment section below subscribe for more videos bye